Hey everybody, this is Professor B. Just wanted to uh, follow up on the uh, recombinant, uh, recombinant DNA technology lecture just to go through a couple of the last few slides with you to explain a few things in case you had any questions. Um, we were talking about inserting genetic material into the cells. Uh, so we have the insertion of foreign DNA into cells. There's a couple of different ways this can be done. Usually transformation is used and uh, in transformation where we're hoping the cells will take up DNA from their environment. We can do this artificially. We can do it with chemicals. In lab, we'll be doing this with calcium chloride. Uh, and another method that can be used is electroporation, where they apply a specific type of electrical current to the culture. This will induce the cells to become what's called competent. Competent bacterial cells are cells that are ready to take up DNA. Another form used in eukaryotic organisms is called protoplast fusion, where cell walls are digested with chemicals and then the remaining cell membrane bound cells are allowed to fuse together. This is used in um, algae and yeast and a few other eukaryotic organisms. Uh, other ways that insertion of DNA into cells can occur is through microinjection or gene gun. On the right, we can see on the top right there, you see uh, IVF. And in IVF, they're inserting genetic material into a cell. Uh, on the left there, you see what's called a gene gun. And uh, this is used to insert genetic material into plant cells. Because plant cells have such thick cellu uh, cellulose cell walls, they will take DNA in liquid form, expose microscopic gold beads to the DNA, They'll soak the beads in the DNA solution and then allow them to dry so that the DNA molecules are actually adhered to the gold surface of the beads. They then take these beads and under high pressure, shoot them, literally shoot them into the plant tissue. So you can see she's got some plant tissue right here and the um, beads are stored up in here and they'll try to shoot these beads down into the plant tissue with the hopes that when the DNA rehydrates within the cell, it will be taken up by the plant cells. This is how, uh, this here is how GMOs were actually made. How do we get DNA? Well, we have to extract it from a cell. So ex DNA extraction is done chemically. It's then uh, cut into restriction enzymes, which is basically just smaller pieces. So they're easier to manage. We can take all of these different pieces, they'll separate them using a process known as electrophoresis that we're going to go over in a minute. And in electrophoresis, we separate uh, DNA molecules by size. So they'll separate them by size and then uh, store them in solution in a deep freezer and that's referred to as a genome library or a gene library. Another method of this is to take messenger RNA, we talked about this in class, using messenger RNA and reverse transcribing the messenger RNA into what's referred to here, you can see here, uh, is cDNA, the C stands for complementary. So we use, remember, uh, eukaryotic genes have those introns and exons, so those have to be removed and it's much easier for us to just take the mRNA for a protein than to try to figure out what's an intron and what's an exon in the actual genome itself. So they take the mRNA, reverse transcribe it. Now we have the exact gene and uh, that's the complementary DNA. And if we want to make the product of that gene, we can then insert that complementary DNA into a bacterial cell. Synthetic DNA is actually made. It's made with a DNA synthesis machine. Um, it's used a lot to make primers or known sequences. Here's just a picture of the complementary DNA. Remember eukaryotes over here on the right, uh, eukaryotes have these exons and introns and only the exons are gonna be put together and actually used to make a protein. So these lighter areas here, these light purple areas are gonna be cut out. So first the DNA is transcribed into RNA and then through a process known as splicing in the nucleus, these introns will be spliced out. Once they get spliced out, we now have the messenger RNA in its true form or pure form. And that's what's gonna go out into the cytoplasm and going to be um, uh, transcribed. 
So we can extract just this part, just the mRNA, and then use that in a gene library or use that to insert it into a bacterial cell. But in reverse transcription, we take this, uh, um, we take this mRNA transcript and we then use complementary base pairing rules and we can make a new DNA molecule based on the sequence of the mRNA molecule. So the mRNA will later be digested and what we have left is now our double-stranded gene, which is intact. We notice it has none of the introns that we saw earlier. So we cut out the introns, make the mRNA, then reverse transcribe the mRNA back into DNA so we can use it in a bacterial cell. This doesn't work for really big giant genes. Um, transformation in recombinant DNA in general only works for smaller genes. Um, one thing to keep in mind with this is um, remember, bacteria do not have those introns and exons, so we can't go straight from a human genome to a bacteria and take out a gene from a human DNA sample and put it into a bacterial cell. We always have to go through that reverse transcription first because our, our, uh, our cells have all those introns and exons, all that excess DNA in our genes. And bacterial cells can't handle that. They don't know what to do with it. They would not be able to cut out these introns. They would transcribe and translate them. And if they did that, that would be an insertion mutation and the gene would not function not to mention it would just be far too large to get into a bacterial cell. This is just another picture of recombinant DNA. Um, we've gone over this several times in class, but we have, you know, that here's that ampicillin resistance gene I was telling you about. This is cutting into the LAC-Z gene for that blue-white spot plating. In yellow here is our, D our foreign DNA, so we just paste that foreign DNA into the middle of that LAC operon, and then we interrupt it. And here again is the blue-white spot plating. So the white colonies are the ones we want to select because the white colonies are the ones that will contain our gene of interest. When we want to make the gene product, so now we want to, um, we want to make sure that we're selecting for these colonies. And if we don't use blue-white spot plating, they can use a method called probing. Now in probing, here we have a bacterial plate with a whole bunch of colonies on it. Now some of these colonies have taken up our gene of interest and some have not, but for some reason or another we're, we're unable to use that blue-white spot plating technique. Maybe X-gal may be toxic to the cells or they won't grow in the presence of lactose. I'm, some, some reason, some bacteria, we can't use that particular method. So here they have this master plate. They have all of their bacteria growing on it. They take this very thin nitrocellulose filter. They want to make basically a copy of the plate. So they lay this filter gently down onto the plate and when they pull it off it has a copy. Has some of the bacteria, some of the DNA from these colonies are now on here like a blueprint. Then this here is going to be treated with detergents. They're going to lice open the cells in order to um, access the DNA and then they're going to treat the fil filter with sodium hydroxide and sodium hydroxide separates the DNA into single strands okay so that we've gone from double stranded DNA it disrupts all those hydrogen bonds and it causes the DNA within these cells to become single stranded now the reason we want this single stranded is because in another tube we have a set of known DNA sequences and these DNA sequences are specific to our gene of interest they are single stranded and they will complementary base pair to any DNA sequence on our colony uh, blueprint here that it can complementary base pair to. So if one of these colonies contains our gene of interest, our probe, this little single piece of single-stranded DNA here, will stick to it. We will know that it's stuck to it because these probes are radioactively labeled. So they soak this filter here after treating it in, with detergents and the sodium hydroxide. They'll then soak it in a solution containing these radioactive probes. They'll take it out and rinse it a couple times. And if our probes 
found their match. If they found the strand of DNA they would complementary base pair to, then they will stay attached to it. If their match is not there, then they'll be washed off. After applying it, um, after rinsing it off, they then take an x-ray of the, the nitrocellulose filter. On the x-ray, we only see the two dots right here, the two colonies that contain our gene of interest. We then compare that to our plate and find those dots on our plate. And now we know that these two colonies here contain our gene of interest. So those are the colonies that I'm going to want to aseptically remove and begin growing an entire, um, an entire stock culture of those bacteria. And this is just an example of um, E. coli here. E. coli is probably the number one bacteria used in most of these uh, recombinant DNA type situations, be mainly because we know so much about its genome, its gram negative, gram negatives work best for this. This is a picture of E. coli that has been genetically engineered to produce an interferon known as gamma interferon, and that's a human specific protein. Uh, the hot pink that you see here is the actual chromosome or genome of the bacterial cell. And all of this bright orange is gamma interferon. So this guy here, this E. coli is doing nothing but producing gamma interferon. That's its job in life. Now, cell wise, these guys don't have a way to get the gamma interferon out of the cell. So they're eventually going to fill up with it because it's unregulated. They will fill up with this gamma interferon and they're going to have to be lysed open in order to obtain it. Once the um, cells have been lysed open, that now introduces endotoxin. Remember, gram-negative cells contain endotoxin. So one of the processes in this is to, um, is to, they have to filter out or they have to process out the endotoxin. So uh, that can be costly and sometimes is part of the reason that uh, pharmaceuticals that are made with recombinant DNA technology can get very expensive, not just because of the science, but because they have to purify the gene product. There's work out there now to try and remove, um, to mutate strains of E. coli so they no longer produce endotoxin. And if they don't produce endotoxin, then that would help to decrease the need for um, purification and help decrease the cost of the, of the medications. Some of the other applications aside from uh, treatments would be vaccines, um, using non-pathogenic viruses to carry a um, gene for a pathogen's antigen, like a vaccine, using gene therapy to help replace or repair a defective or mutated gene. Um, out there is what's called the Human Genome Project. Uh, that was uh, finished several years ago. They had three random DNA samples from people all over the world, and they put them together and they sequenced the entire genome. Now, we don't know what all of those sequences mean. Many of them we do, but there are still, um, there are still large regions of the human genome. We don't know what it does. RNA interference is um, a pretty new method. It's been used in a couple of... Um, believe it or not, in pesticides uh, to try and assist in viral infections and that in honeybees. It's also been used um, experimentally, or you could say um, it's in testing in human use. It's a fairly new application where they take short little pieces of, um, of double-stranded RNA. So what we have here is, let's kind of take a look at this diagram. So I have DNA up here and the DNA gets transcribed into an RNA transcript which will get processed and these little introns here will get cut out. And what I have left now is a messenger RNA molecule. Always remember that messenger RNA is single stranded. So in this case I take what's called short interference RNA and I bind to my um, mRNA molecule. And by binding to it on either side or more often than not, complementary base pairing to it. So I would take one of these and actually attach it and make my mRNA double-stranded. The ribosome can't attach or will fall apart when it reaches that double-stranded region and it causes the RNA complex to be broken down. 
So short interference RNA or siRNA um, causes the, the actual mRNA molecule itself to eventually be enzymatically destroyed. Our pro our, we have enzymes that will break it down, mainly because it makes RNA become double-stranded and ribosomes can't read double-stranded RNA. So if you have, you want to stop someone from producing a particular protein, the theory here, the idea here is that if somebody is producing a particular protein in excess, meaning they're producing too much of it, um, they are, um, they're not, they have proteins that are not functioning properly. You can target uh, the particular mRNA, a particular mRNA molecule that might be involved in that pathway and introduce these uh, short interference RNAs into those cells. If those uh, short interference RNAs get introduced into the cells, then they will target the mRNA for the protein that you're trying to regulate and uh, shut off or turn off its expression. Here we have um, an, an electrophoresis panel here on the right. This is from an actual case study um, of a uh, outbreak of a gastrointestinal disease in a hospital. In electrophoresis, I'm going to use a marker here so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Uh, works. We'll take the pen. All right. Uh, in electrophoresis, we use a gel. And with that gel, we... Um, uh, we insert DNA. So up here at the top, this is the top of the gel, right? So this is the top. And there's little wells, right, cut into this agar. It's an agar very similar to the agar, the agar plates that we use. They just call it agarose. It's the same kind of solidifying agent, but it doesn't have any nutrients in it. So it's just plain jello. And we create these wells all the way across. Each of the lanes will have a well. And then we put our genetic sample, our DNA sample in liquid form in a well. We then take this, it's kind of a, a large flat square gel. We put this gel in a large chamber called an electrophoresis chamber and we add buffer. So it's underwater, it's under a, in a liquid buffer solution. You guys will do this in lab. You'll see what we're talking about. And then we apply an electrical current to the gel. Now this side, this end of the gel will have a negative anode and this end of the gel will have a positive anode. And our DNA, the DNA itself is negatively charged. So when we apply this electrical current, it causes the DNA to be attracted to the positive cathode, right? And it's a bad arrow, but you get the point. So it's attracted to this positive end. Now, when this occurs, our DNA that samples that we put in here have been cut with restriction enzymes. And remember, restriction enzymes cut DNA into a whole bunch of pieces. As our DNA runs through this gel, the gel works as a matrix. And as these small fragments of DNA run through the gel, they begin to run at different rates. Very large pieces of DNA are going to run very slowly and really, um, really small pieces of DNA are going to run very quickly. So if our DNA starts to separate, here we're separating the DNA fragments by size and by charge. So here I have all of these DNA fragments and each one of these lanes, right, each lane represents one sample. So these three samples here, let me get my eraser and get rid of that. All right, so we've cleared all of the markings on there. I'll just go ahead and put the, um, put the charge back up there because I want you to see that. Okay, so we've gone from negative to positive and we've separated out all of these DNA samples. And again, each lane represents a single sample. So if we take a look at this gel here, what we know is that if the genome is identical between two, organi two different organisms, then this is referred to as a DNA fingerprint, then the DNA fingerprint will be the same. This works for bacteria because if we have bacteria that are cloning each other, remember binary fission. If bacteria are reproducing asexually, then the genome between the two cells will never vary. 
it will always be the same because they're just making a photocopy of it. But if I have a different strain of bacteria being cut with the same restriction enzymes, then its DNA fingerprint is going to be different because its gene sequence is different or its DNA sequence is different. So here I have, um, in this case here, this was a, a hospital outbreak, a nosocomial outbreak of a gastrointestinal infection caused by a particular type of hemorrhagic E. coli. And they ran these DNA sequences, these, these DNA fingerprints on multiple, on multiple samples so they could compare the DNA from the bacteria causing disease in the patient to uh, the DNA in bacteria found in what they suspected was apple juice. So they believed that in the kitchen, somewhere in the kitchen, apple juice got contaminated with this strain of E. coli. And then this apple juice was being served to patients part of um, you know, part of their meal and there were multiple patients who when they extracted back to the E. coli that they were looking for they extracted that E. coli from fecal samples of all of these patients and they then compared the genomes of those E. coli so the first three lanes here one two and three on these three lanes they used um, DNA from the E. coli that was found in the apple juice and they wanted to make sure that um, they were, you know, did this repetitively to make sure that it was the same E. coli each time. So what you can see here is all of the bands in these three lanes all match. So they all have this fragment here. They all have this large one here. They all have these three here. They're not only do they have this, the strain, strands, but those strands are all in the same place. Right? So they have all the strands in the same place. Now the next couple of lanes, so let's see here, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six. They have them both here. I'm going to go with a seven here. So these seven here are from patient samples. And these are from patients who they looked back in their, new, their uh, uh, lunch records or they looked back in, in the meal records for those patients in the, that remember this is in the hospital so they would have record of those meals and all of those patients drank the apple juice that was being served to them so you can see all of these guys have the same right so let's use this lane right here as our reference this one here look they all have the same bands they not only match in the presence of the bands but where those bands occur on the gel itself, the distance that they ran. So we're just matching. We're just matching up um, these bands. Now over here, we have E. coli. So these are patients who were ill, but they are saying they did not drink the apple juice. They either were not served the apple juice or they didn't drink it. In that case, we're gonna look at these three patients here. And in these three, this guy looks like this one here has the same strain of E. coli infection as the others. But what we see here is there is a difference. So all of these guys, they have two bands right here. They have two bands. None of these do. So none of these patients are infected with the same E. coli strand as the others. So their E. coli infection did not come from the, uh, the apple juice. They got it from somewhere else. Alrighty, so we're going to move on. Now, southern blotting, we're going to combine two of the different things we learned about. First, we're going to cut up DNA with restriction enzymes. We're then going to take these, these fragments, you can see here, right, these fragments, and in these fragments of DNA, one of the fragments contains our gene of interest, right? So right there is our gene of interest. We're gonna, but all of these fragments are in a solution in a small little vial. So we're going to take a sample of that vial, and we're gonna put it into an agarose gel and we're gonna run electrophoresis. And when we run the electrophoresis, you can see that we separate the DNA by size. So we have all these fragments of DNA. But what I don't know, I still don't know, is which of these fragments contains my genetic material. So my next step is to kind of figure that out. So we put a nitrocellulose filter on top of this gel, just like we did on that plate. We're going to do the same thing, but it's going to be on top of a gel. We then put the gel on, on a sponge. You can see there's, here's the sponge. So we put the gel on top of a sponge, 
Here's our filter, right? That's the filter right there. And we put a big stack of these specialized types of absorbent paper towels. They're super high absorbent. We then take this whole sponge paper towel gel setup, this whole big sandwich here, and we put it in a salt solution okay, right here. Now this salt solution will be drawn up by the sponge, but these paper towels are super absorbent as well. So they're actually going to draw or attract the fluid up into the paper towels. Sometimes um, a small weight is put on top to try and sandwich everything together real tight. Now as this salt solution moves across the sponge and gel and these paper towels, as it, it gets absorbed up here, it's going to draw the DNA onto this nitrocellulose filter. So the, the liquid will get drawn through the sponge and then through the gel and then across this filter up into these paper towels. We don't care about the liquid. What we care about is getting copies of the DNA onto our nitrocellulose filter. This filter, just like the last one in the, um, we were looking using the probes, we do the same thing. And of course, what does the salt solution do? The salt solution causes our DNA to become single stranded. So now our nitrocellulose filter here has copies of our genetic material in single strands. We put the nitrocellulose filter in a bag with the radioactively probes and allow it to soak. Our probe is complementary to our gene of interest. If our gene of interest is present in any of those fragments, it's going to show up. So the probe is going to stick to it. When the probe sticks to it and then we come over here and we develop the x-ray film, that's what they're doing is x-ray film, then only the band that contains my gene of interest, oops, sorry about that, only the band that contains my gene of interest is going to, is going to show up on the x-ray. I can then take this x-ray back, lay it on top of the original gel, and figure out which band, which in this case is this one, contains my gene of interest. I can then use literally a little X-Acto knife, cut this little band out of the gel, and dissolve the gel and have my DNA of interest in solution. We've already looked at, uh, these are some agricultural um, applications of DNA technology. Um, this was just another example here. They're doing it with plants. Um, I'm not going to ask you about agrobacterium, so we're going to skip that. A few things to think about are some safety issues. Uh, uh, you do want to make sure, like in the GMO crops, there's big concern that there's going to be accidental release so that we get weeds that start becoming herbicide resistant, which can be a problem if we're trying to get rid of weeds. Genetically modified crops have to be safe for consumption. So what you're actually adjusting in the genome has to be, um, has to be safe uh, for consumption by humans. Uh, who's going to have access to somebody's genetic information? This whole 23andMe and the, the chromosome, uh, I forget the name of it, but there's a, a couple of different places you can send your, gen, your cheek cells into and they will tell you all kinds of things about your, your own personal genome but they keep that information on a database. One of the big allures of 23andMe is to find out if you have some distant cousin or something like that. They can only do that and notify you if they keep your genetic information on file. So who, who gets to keep your genetic information? Who gets to look at that? There's been quite a few um, upsets. Uh, as far as this is concerned. One, there was always the big upset about the nationwide DNA uh, database called CODIS that's used in the criminal justice system. That if you are arrested, you do not have to be convicted. If you are simply arrested for a felony, you have to give a DNA sample and they will run it through CODIS. What they're doing is they're comparing your DNA sample to DNA samples that have been found at crime scenes and other places to, um, uh, where the law has been broken to see if you were there because DNA is so specific. Another concern that happened with actually with 23andMe is 23andMe has this really big database of all of these genomes and there are parts of it you can sign up to actually register to search the database yourself so people can search other people's DNA and some very smart forensic scientists started doing this with DNA samples from crime scenes. 
So they were finding the relatives of criminals and then tracking down the criminal from there. So that has been uh, kind of shut down for now, uh, but it's really like an opt-in, opt-out thing for people with um, in these databases. And it's, uh, it's a little scary who can actually uh, have access to your genetic information. Another major concern is insurance companies. What if you, um, your, you have your genome looked at and your insurance company gets a hold of it and says, oh, look at that, you're at a higher genetic risk for heart disease. Well, we're going to raise your rates so that later in life, when you do get heart disease, you're covered. Who says that you're going to get heart disease later in life? Just because you're at a higher genetic risk does not necessarily mean that it's going to occur. Now, the catch is if you know you're at a higher genetic risk, you of course would take better care of yourself so it doesn't happen to try and offset that risk. But insurance companies won't, won't uh, guarantee that. So there's concern that insurance companies may start trying to look at people's genomes and adjusting their actual premiums or, or their rates based on genetic information. And that's not necessarily um, fair to the consumer. So that's just um, some of the end information. Uh, there is a little bit of that on the test. Like I said, uh, if you have any questions about, particularly about the electrophoresis, you do have um, an essay question that asks quite a few questions uh, on interpreting a DNA gel, an electrophoresis gel. So if you have any issues um, with that, please make sure that you text me. Um, I'm not gonna answer the question that's on the exam, so don't text me while you're taking the exam. But um, if you're uh, listening to the lecture or or looking up Googling and, and looking at videos or anything, and you're confused on something, please feel free to email or text me. Good luck on the exam. I know you guys are going to do great. Have a good one.